So today we're going to talk about one-to-one -one functions and inverses. Okay. A function is one-to-one -one if no two inputs have the same output. So a a, an equation is a function if each if each y has if each x has a particular y okay if each x has just one y to go with it no two y's for any one x it's a function remember the vertical line test okay each x has just one y it could be the same y for every x but each x has only one y value. No x has two different y values to go with it. That's what makes it a function. A function is one to one if every y also has only one x. So every x and then every y is paired together. No other x, no other y will have that. Will, will, no other x will share that same y. No other y will share that same x. That's what one to one means. Okay. Now. Two ways to do it. The horizontal line test, and I have no idea why a sandwich is in there, other than maybe you're cutting it horizontally. Okay. And the horizontal line test, HLT, OPLT, HLT, that's not happening. Okay. If a function passes the horizontal line test, then its inverse is also a function. So, a function passes the vertical line test. If we pass the vertical line across, and it only touches in one and only one place, that's the vertical line. That means it's a function. It's one-to-one -one if it also passes the horizontal line test. So if I pass the horizontal line across it and it only touches once, once and only once at any one time, then it is also one-to-one. -one, then it's one-to-one. -one. It means each x has one y and each y has the same x no matter what. There are no two x's with the same y. There are no two y's with the same x. Okay. Thing about one to ones is they is that they're inverse functions are also functions. Okay, if a fun, if a function is one to one, then its inverse is also a function as well. So let's take a look at some examples here. And it says graph to determine if the functions are one on one, one to one. But you can also kind of get an idea from looking at some of them whether or not the possibilities are. When you have a polynomial in particular. If you have an even one, it will never be one to one. Because an even function, the ends point in the same direction, either up or down, and that will not pass a horizontal line test, no matter what. You're not going to pass a horizontal line about something with the ends going the same direction. So if it's an even function, or I should say if it has, you know, if, if it's an even um, degree on there, then it's not going to be one to one. So if I look at this first graph, that does not pass the horizontal line test. Crosses more than one place. Fails the horizontal line test. This is not one to one. It is a function because it does pass the vertical line test, but it's not a one to one function. Okay, so we're taking we're taking you take the big group of equations, narrow it down to functions. And then we're taking those functions and narrowing them down to one-to-one -one functions, which have some special properties of their own. Okay. So I look at the next one, x cubed. So, okay, I know that it looks like this. Question is, do I have humps in the middle or not? If I have humps in the middle, it might not be one-to-one. -one. But an odd function often doesn't. Now, this is completely odd. Generally speaking, when they are completely odd, there are no humps in the middle. The only time you have a hump in the middle is when you have an even power top finger with the rest of the odd powers. I have nothing but odd powers. This is an odd function. This is one-to-one. -one. It passes the horizontal line test. There is no horizontal line anywhere that crosses this more than once. So that one is not... That one's not one to one. This one is one to one. Okay. Now the last one. 
What kind of a function is the last one? Simpler than that. It's just a line. It's a linear function, right? Straight lines are going to be one-to-one -one with one exception. Horizontal lines. Y equals some number are not one-to-one. -one. Any other line has an angle to it. And they will pass the horizontal line test. Okay? There is no horizontal line that passes through that more than once. The only one where you would ever have it not be one to one if it's a horizontal if it's a straight line is if it's y equals some some number that's a horizontal line, the horizontal line massively fails the horizontal line test. Not only does a horizontal line touch that horizontal line at, at more than one spot, it touches it everywhere. So it massively fails the horizontal line test. All other lines are essentially one to one. Okay. Questions? And like I said, there are some particular things about one to one functions that are important to have, you working with inverses and things like that. Right now, we're just identifying them as one to one. Okay, okay. inverse functions and relations. In an inverse function, inputs and outputs are switched. So your x and y's swap. The input of one is the output of the other. Inverse functions undo each other. Think about squares and squares and square roots. The input of one is the output of the other. They undo each other. Okay. Notation. The inverse of a function f is f inverse. We put a little negative one on top. Okay. Does not mean it's one over that. When we're talking functions, when you're talking about functions, inverse functions, the negative one does not mean one over that. If I have x to the negative 1 all by itself, that's 1 over x. If I have f of x and I have the inverse there, that is not me. 1 over f to the negative 1 of x does not mean 1 over f of x. Okay, if we're talking functions and we use that negative 1 power on the function notation, it is not 1 over that object. Okay. This will be important, really important when we're talking about inverse trig functions. Because that's the notation you use for inverse trig notation. Really, really, really important to do that. Graphs of inverses. It's actually really easy to do this. In algebra 2, you did do this. Remember the paper fold? You took your pencil and you traced on a, on a graph. And then you folded the paper across the diagonal line and you did the, the you, you, you used your, your rubbing tool. Usually a thumbnail worked really well for me. And then you unfolded it where it had transferred over. Yeah, that's that's what they're talking about. Inverses reflect across the line y equals x. The diagonal line y equals x. Inverse functions reflect across that. Okay, and you did you, you covered that in algebra two last year. So here's what I want you to do. You've got the graph on your paper. You've got the chart. This is f of x. Plot those points. Draw the line through those points. This is f, and I'm going to change color here for when I graph it, going to make it easier. This is f inverse of x. Fill in the chart by swapping the x and y coordinates that are in this chart. For example, the first line is already done for you. If x is, if, if you have the point negative 2, 4 in f, you have the point 4, negative 2 in f inverse. So do that. Swap the points. Graph this one. Graph f. Plot the points. Graph f. Swap all the points. 
graph f inverse. And for snorts and giggles, graph the line y equals x as well. All three of those on that graph. Okay. So by magic, it's done. Whoever's watching a video at home, all of a sudden, boom, it's done. So, um, this is the relationship between a function and its inverse. Notice, it is reflected across the line y equals x. If you take a minute to connect each point with the corresponding point in its inverse, so if I take the point negative 2, 4, and 4, negative 2, and I connect them up together, this point here and this point here, and I connect them up together, that line crosses the line y equals x, it's perpendicular, and it cuts it in half. It's equidistant from it. Every single point on a function and on its inverse has that property. It reflects through. That means every point in its corresponding inverse are exactly that way. Now, so I think we've guessed and figured out what the original function here is. This would be x, y equals x squared, right? Probably, most likely, y equals x squared, although there are other functions that would start out this way that could do that, but this is more than likely where it is. Is this actually a function? Does this pass the vertical line test? Yeah, this passes the vertical line test. This is a function. Is this one to one? No. No, I have this, I have two x's have the same y. In fact, I have almost every x except for the origin has a corresponding x with the same y. It is not one to one. What that means is I know immediately that this is not a function. It is an equation. It is not a function. If the original one is not one to one, then the inverse is not one to one. And it's not, it's not a function. I mean, because if it doesn't pass the horizontal line test, its inverse is not going to pass the vertical line test. <laughs> okay. So if this is not one to one, this is not a function. If this is one to one, this is a function. Okay. Questions so far? Okay, now we're going to get to the heart of the matter, actually finding inverse equations. Now, I say inverse equations because not all of these are functions when we get done. So, step number one. Replace f of x with y if necessary. When would it not be necessary to replace f of x with y? When it's already y and you don't have f of x. So sometimes it's not necessary. Okay. Step two, switch x and y. So once you've done that, then what you do is replace it. You take x and y and replace them. Swap them. Step number three, solve for y. And that gives you your inverse function. So, for example, first one. I want to compute, I want to find the inverse. First step, replace f of x. Well, I don't need to do that. It's already not there. Second step, swap the x and y. So instead of y equals x squared plus 3, I have x equals y squared plus 3. That's the step. That's swapping x and y. Yes? Why doesn't the squared follow that x? Because I'm just swapping the variables. I'm not changing anything else, just where the variables are. So if there's any possibility, you just get it Yeah, I just take... I just take y, make it x, and take x and make it y. Nothing else changes, period. Now I solve for x. Oh, sorry, solve for y. I want to get y by itself now. So I solve this equation for y. Subtract 3. x minus 3 equals y squared. Take the square root of both sides. y equals plus or minus the square root of x minus 3. Why do I have plus or minus? It could be either one of them. When you're solving by taking the square root, you must consider both possibilities. 
I found my inverse. That's my inverse function. The inverse of x squared plus 3 is the square root of x minus 3. Is my inverse a function? No, it's not. If you were to graph a square root, that's exactly what we kind of, that's, that's very close to what we just did. Because what is x squared plus 3? It's a parabola, right? Yeah. And if we turn that parabola on its side and count the plus and count the minus, what do we have? We don't have a function. The first one is not one-to-one. -one. Its inverse is not a function. Okay. Now, what we will often do, okay, what we will often do in order to make it a function is we will only use certain parts of it. So you can do, you, you can adjust, and this is something that, that when you get to calculus next year, you will do this, because I've done it with class several times, is that sometimes in order to make an equation work as a function, you limit the domain or you limit the range. So if I wanted to take y equals plus or minus the square root of x minus 3 and make it a function, all I have to do is say, hey, I'm either only going to talk about the plus or I'm only going to talk about the minus. I'm not going to consider both the plus and the minus. If I only consider the positive square root, that means I only have the top half of the sideways parabola. That is a function. Okay. If I only talk about the bottom half, do the minus square root. That is a function. We can, if we choose to, limit the range. Say, hey, we're only going to talk about the top half because we want to have a function. We can do that if necessary. We're not going to do that now. I'm just saying that is something that you can make that adjustment if we need to make that adjustment. We can say, hey, we're going to limit our domain from here to here, or we're going to limit our range from here to here. By doing that, we, we can adjust things to make them fit our needs. And knowing that we are adjusting things to make them fit our needs. Okay. So, second one, number six. First step. Take f of x, make it y. So we get y equals 2x minus 7 over 4. Step 2, switch the x and the y. x equals 2y minus 7 over 4. Step 3, solve for y. I'll let you do this one. Okay, so that should be enough time to take care of that one. Um, this is actually not that bad. Multiply both sides by 4. 4x four equals 2y minus 7. Add 7. 4x plus 7 equals 2y. Divide by 2. y equals 4x plus 7 over 2. And yes, this is a function. It's a straight line. So is the other one. They're both straight lines, so yes, this is a function. Yeah, you can do that if you want to. I wouldn't. I'd keep it like this. Now, many of you or some of you may have tried to do the next one. It's kind of difficult, isn't it? Yeah, part of the reason I had you do this one on your own and not do that one on your own is because, yes, you can do that. It is a little tricky, though. And I wanted to make sure that you saw, because there are some tricks to doing stuff or things. Once you see them, you go, oh, okay, I get it. This is one that's a little tricky. First step, still the same. Y equals 2X plus 1 over X minus 1. Swap the X's and Y's. X equals 2Y plus 1 over X, sorry, over Y minus 1. Okay, now is where it gets tricky. Okay, first step. Get rid of the fractions. Multiply both sides by y minus 1. And distribute on this side here, that side, they, these just cancel. This side, go ahead and distribute. So you have xy minus x equals 2y plus 1. Don't worry, trust me. 
I know what I'm doing. Put all the Y's on one side and anything that's not a Y on the other side. So add X to both sides and subtract 2Y from both sides. So you get XY minus 2Y equals X plus 1. Factor out Y. Y equals, sorry, Y times, my bad, Y times X minus 2 equals X plus 1. Divide both sides by X minus 2. Y equals X plus 1 over X minus 2. Yeah, I don't think that's a function, but I'm not sure off the top of my head. So I'm not sure. Let me see if my notes have it. No, I do not have. Yes, it is a function. Yes. It is a function. Okay. okay. Quiet, please. Um, yes, this one is a function. No, if you were to graph it out, you'll see. It does. It does pass the or it passes the vertical line just when you do it. Yeah, you will not. You will not be stuck with just a scientific on this one. Okay. So this is probably about as difficult as it gets. Now, most functions, if not all, I'll. All functions have inverses. Whether or not the inverses are functions themselves, not always true. And whether or not their inverses are able to be found algebraically doesn't always work either. There are times where it's extremely difficult if not impossible, to algebraically calculate an inverse. If I had squares and cubes mixed in there on something like that, I could very easily come up with an equation that would not be calculable to find the inverse. You're not going to be able to solve for the variable on its own. Does not mean that the inverse does not exist. It just means finding it algebraically is basically impossible. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means that calculating it by the standard means of algebraic calculation are really just not going to happen. Okay. I would never ask you to do something like that. Any ones that I ask you to find the inverse, you can find the inverse. I'm not going to ask you to find something that it cannot be done. That's probably that last one is probably about as difficult as it gets. Okay, and it's probably about as difficult as it gets. And I, and I'll be perfectly honest, I do these once or twice a year like this, and I have to, okay, now how do I, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've been doing them often enough, but I can usually, it only takes me a, a, a little bit to remember how to do it. But, yeah, your first step, get rid of the fractions. You hate fractions. We all hate fractions. Get rid of the fractions. Multiply both sides by the denominator, and your fraction goes away. Okay, that's your trick to doing those. Okay? questions on that. Now, the last part of our notes that we have for today okay, goes back to what we were doing yesterday. If two relationships are inverses, if they are inverses of each other, then F composed of F inverse of X equals X and F inverse composed of F equals x. Remember when we did this yesterday and we had f of g and g of f and had to show that they were both equal to each other and equal to x? That's proving that they are inverses. And yes, you need to do both of them. You can't just do one composition and call it good. You need to do both compositions and prove that both compositions are equal to X. Okay. Now, eight 
is pretty simple. Why don't you guys go ahead and attempt to prove to me that eight are actually inverse functions? No, 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 no. You're doing the composition, what we're doing yesterday. Taking one function, sticking it inside the other, and then you're doing the same thing in reverse. Unless you want to do nine. I'll do nine. I'll let make you guys do eight. Okay. Try it. Do the compositions. Take F and stick it into F inverse. Take F inverse, stick it into F. Okay. Let's do this one. So first thing you need to do is find F composed of F inverse of X. So I take F inverse, stick it into X. So that means I have the square root of x minus 2 squared plus 2, which I square the square root. That means I have x minus 2 plus 2, which is x. That's good. I am not done. I am only halfway done because I need to do the other one as well. F of F inverse composed of F equals, I take F, stick it in F inverse. So I have the square root of X squared plus 2 minus 2, which is the square root of X squared, which is X. It's good. They are inverses. Ladies. Okay, now, you got to loosen up for the next one. It's a little more difficult, but, but if you understand what to do, it actually simplifies down really, really, really quick. Okay? So, your first thing you need to do is set it up. F composed of F inverse of x is, I'm going to start it down here, so I have 3 of negative 2x over x minus 3 all over negative 2x over x minus 3 plus 2. No, they don't just cancel. <laughs> Because I don't have the same denominator under everything. Now, there are a couple of ways to do this. I find the absolute easiest way to do something like this is get rid of the compound fraction first. Your common denominator of your upper fraction and your lower fraction multiply by that. So, my common denominator would be x minus 3. So what I do is I multiply by x minus 3 over x minus 3. Now when I multiply the numerator by that, these cancel each other, and I have 3 times negative 2x, which is negative 6x. And then my denominator, I have to multiply everything by that. Now this one, it just cancels, so I get minus 2x. And then I have plus 2 times x minus 3, which is 2x minus 6. Did I distribute the 2 times x minus 3? It does. It canceled with this one. But I also have this, which does not have a denominator, right? That's why you can't just cancel the denominators, because not everything has the denominator on it. So what happens? Minus 2x plus 2x, they cancel each other out. I have negative 6x over negative 6, which is just plain old x. Okay. Now, if I do the same thing on the next one, same idea. 
f inverse of x is. I take f of x and stick it into the inverse. So that means I have negative 2 times 3x over x plus 2 all over 3x over x plus 2 minus 3. Multiply by x plus 2. Multiply by x plus 2 over x plus 2. And remember, I am multiplying both the numerator and the denominator. So when I multiply by x plus 2 over x plus 2, what am I actually multiplying by? 1. That's why I can do it. These two cancel. Negative 2 times 3x is a negative 6x. This cancels. So I get 3x. And then I have negative 3 times x plus 2 gives me negative 3x minus 6. Ooh, looky, looky. My 3x and minus 3x cancel. Negative 6x over 6. Negative 6 gives me x. It works. Okay. When you are doing your work, remember this. Tricks and tips on how to do things. If you have a compound fraction, first step, get rid of the compound fraction by multiplying by the denominators to get rid of them. Yes, question. So, like, all the tests say you give us a matrix, how would you want us to answer the question? You have to do that. You have to do both of them. So, just leave all the right circle X. Yeah. And, or may, you might want to put there, they both equal X, therefore they are inverses or something like that. But realistically, here's the thing that most students do they get mark, that they lose series points over. They only do half. They only do this, or they only do this. They don't do both. I'm telling you right now, you don't do both, you get half credit at best. <laughs> okay? And it's, that's, that's usually what happens on this question, because I ask it, you know, chapter one in calculus. This is one of the questions on the test. Prove that they're inverses. And kids always do half. The ones that screwed up only do half. 